So um, thank you very much for coming to my class. A little delay uh, because of reasons, as you know. <laughs> There's always plenty of reasons not to begin in time. Um, yes, so the course is called <laughs> Regular, no, sorry, The Secrets of the Loaded Brush and some general ph philosophy. Um, so I would like to show you um, an introduction uh, onto the, the technique that is called a loaded brush. It's actually a technique that uh, I would not say it was invented by, but it was certainly pioneered a lot by my good friend uh, Ben, Ben Comets. So um, it's uh, actually also nothing that he has invented, but it's a technique that he has seen somewhere in, a, uh, in an old um, watercoloring book. Um, so uh, basically it is uh, a technique with which you can achieve uh, very, very smooth blendings in a very fast time. And um, that is something that miniature painters were always looking for, like it's a little bit like the holy grail, or it was for, for a long time, uh, a very smooth blending. Um, and the problem was that before that it came with a big price tag, so to say, because it took a lot of time to achieve a very, very smooth blending, for example, using regular uh, layering. So. Um, uh, the thing is that, for example, like just one of the examples is that uh, many, many years ago I attended, uh, um, I think it was the Games Day in, um, I think it was in, in Germany even, where there was one um, uh, uh, teacher showing how to achieve a nice red in 120 simple steps. And that was like seriously what they were aiming for. So through layering, achieving a nice uh, transition. and. I thought, well, I don't have time for this because <laughs> life is too precious, uh, the blendings need to be way quicker, so therefore um, we were like always looking a little bit for a, for a technique that would make it just easier to, to, to achieve a really nice blending. And um, you can see it, let's see, I will sit down here. Um, we have developed a little bit like a more or less, we hope, a comprehensive, um, Applications of the loaded brush. Um, in our point of view, it's more or less three different applications that um, that you need in order to paint nearly anything. Um, so yeah, you can see it here a little bit. So uh, on the the first one is, for example, the regular loaded, loaded brush. It is uh, a technique that is um, usually applied. For example, if you have, it's, it's very hard to see, I guess, but. Um, if, you, for example, you paint a goblin or something like that, something um, that has not two small surfaces, but it's like uh, muscle groups or, um, or such a like, um, this is something that you will uh, apply most of the time when you're applying a loaded brush. So, um, yeah, it is, um, as you can see, on, on something like this uh, surface. Then you have something for larger surfaces. Um, there was one example of, for example, this Kingdom Death Spedicule here. Um, that just required just you know to, to apply it more evenly on a just like much larger surface and this is also possible but there are some things that you need to keep in mind uh, while doing that and uh, finally there is also a way how to apply these very very tiny small um, f uh, finishing surfaces uh, that you can see also on the spider here on the on the nose for example uh, here. Um, yeah, also here on this, these little, these little, imp like, little um, nooks and crannies that you see on a, on a, on a spider like that. Okay, um, so in this uh, workshop we will be trying to, uh, yeah, just practice that, you know, to just get an introduction also and have a possibility to, um, to, to see uh, how you can apply um, that and just like train it in an environment which is also a real life situation and this is quite important with the loaded brush because the philosophy behind it so to say might be easy to understand but it's very very hard actually to master the technique um, to um, to really know what uh, kind of things you could improve in order to uh, achieve a smoother transition a smoother flow of the blending um, I would like also to use the opportunity to tell you a little bit about my setup that I have usually. Um, this is not representative of what I have at home at all. Um, it is very, very important that you find a setup that you are very comfortable with. Um, otherwise, you will get some problems like posture problems. Um, you will not be able to paint for a very long time. So this table, for example, here is way too low for me. Um, you, because 
working on a surface like this will always like automatically uh, cause me to lower my head and just like what like, look down. And this is something that you should really avoid because your muscles kind of hold your head all the time. And um, that is something really that we, when you paint, like, let's, let's say like three to four, maybe even six hours, um, you will really have some, some pain and some issues. And not only talking about this, but also with, with time, um, you might have some serious health issues. So make sure that the, um, the surface that you have is a little bit more elevated. Some people also work with a box that is uh, in front of them and then they, they put their, um, their arms onto the surface and then they paint a little bit like around this so they keep a straight back. It's extremely important. Then obviously the light is also important. Well, in this case here, it's a, it's a camera setup, so you usually have this very, very bright light, uh, which is nice. Um, it depends also, um, like there are also like different philosophies following light. Some people prefer um, white light, like it's also well, just sometimes called daylight bulbs. Although the light has not much to do with sunlight because sunlight has a different spectrum. It's a little bit more yellowish. So um, the whiter the light is, the more neutral your color will be. And uh, there will be no um, additional, for example, emotion that you see like from the yellow light in the, in the miniature. So it will be very cold you, uh, most of the time and very, very quite neutral. But um, some people really prefer working with a little bit more yellowish light. Um, I personally too like it a little bit more. Uh, it's also something I think maybe psychological that you that you that you just you know don't don't paint under this like clinically white light all the time. But um, this is something that you have to to make sure that it doesn't drop like your hand doesn't drop a shadow on. Oh yeah, this is also. Pretty nice, yes, actually. <laughs> yeah, this is actually much nicer now because I have both. So, <laughs> all right, and um, you see that um, you should not drop a um, uh, shadow on your miniature when you when you when you paint. Um, also, when you film uh, things, it's important uh, that the light that you use uh, that it is actually in a certain hertz rate, so it doesn't flicker on a, on a film. Um, usually some of the lights, they, they have exactly like 50 or 60 hertz. And this is really not so ideal because you, you will see some flickering on your footage. So that's not so ideal. And actually very strong light will really also, it can um, affect your eyes. It can make you, give you some headaches. So, you know, find a nice setup for yourself um, and, um, and that you are happy with. Also painting for a longer time, it will keep you more healthy, so to say. All right, then um, a little bit about the, the setup, uh, like more in depth. Um, some of you might not know what this here is. It's an improvised wet palette. Um, a wet palette is bas basically um, um, like a palette that um, keeps your, your acrylic colors moist or like your water-based colors moist. Um, for miniatures, we mostly use acrylics because they are very easy to, um, to handle. Uh, they have very high pigmentation and um, Actually, they are also um, just delivering the result that we kind of need uh, most of the times. There are also other like specialized colors that have, um, for example, alcohol um, mediums in them, alcoholic mediums in them, oils, um, you know, you know, all kinds of, uh, of colors. But um, for most of the things that we need, we need something that is actually water-based. So that is a... A wet palette generally, like an improvised one, is basically just a container that will avoid, uh, that, that will keep the water in there. And then you have some, some paper towel that you um, really soak wet with, with, with water. Um, some people, like a lot of people actually, they, they don't have this here wet enough. It needs to be like really soaking, like a, like a pool, so to say. Otherwise, it will dry up and the paper will just like, um, uh, do those like folds and in these folds the color will then dry up so really make sure that your palette is soaking wet um, and also add some add, uh, some additional padding it is important that this here is, is rather white and also that the parchment paper that you choose is also white because therefore you will be able to judge the paints better on a white uh, surface and also see the dilution on your on your paints a little bit uh, on your palette a little bit better so this is quite good and then here I have um, not one, but usually I have three uh, cups of water uh, here. This is because I um, usually um, don't like to do a, like to to. I like to switch between colors quite often and quite quickly, 
Um, so not only I need a clear water a reservoir nearby all the time to um, get rid of pigment that is in the brush, but also when I paint uh, uh, metallic uh, parts, um, yeah, metallic uh, paints. Uh, metallic paints, they usually have uh, metallic pigments in them, and when you mix that in your, in your painting water and then apply a non-metallic color to something, uh, you will always see hints of these uh, pigments in there. And this is really can spoil everything for you. So uh, always make sure to, to have these three pots. And then the most left one, like the one opposite of my dominant arm, is, um, is the pure metal pigment one. Um, this here is the pure uh, non-metallic pigment one, and this here is the one that kind of is in between them. So when, I, when, I, when I'm using metallic paint, I clear it in this pot here, and then I go in the middle pot again, and then I'm 100% sure that I don't have metallic pigment on my brush. Um, yes, a little, like some more words maybe to the brushes that I use um, here. That's a Winsor Newton Series 7 uh, size 2 brush. Um, Usually with these brushes, like they're natural hair bristle brush, uh, br brushes, I can maybe do it like that. Um, and if you look at the brush, uh, you will have certain parts that also um, uh, will change the properties, so to say. So the metal part back here is called the ferrule. It's um, where it holds the bristles together. In front, you have the, the brush itself um, with the back part here um, being called the reservoir. Um, and then the very the, the tip, just, you know, which is the, the, the front part here. Um, it is very, very important that you have a brush that can hold a very sharp tip. And uh, Winsor Newton, or like natural bristles, saber brushes, they usually can do that. Um, some people think that to paint like very fine miniatures, you need a very small brush because that somehow is intuitive and makes sense. But actually, it's not the case. Uh, the thing that you need to have is a brush that holds a very sharp tip, like this one here. Um, with this, you will be able to paint the, the finest details, basically, and um, you will not need to have a zero, 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 or triple zero brush. Uh, it's all about the tip, so to say. And the reservoir, like the size of the reservoir, um, tells you how much pigment and how much paint the, the, color, uh, the, the brush can, can keep, um, which will then, while you paint, will be just like transferred to the tip and released on the surface. So the bigger the reservoir, the longer time you will have to, to paint with your brush. Um, <coughs> and also, the longer this, this, this size here is, the, um, the least reactive your brush will be. So for example, if you, want, if you imagine you are drawing, um, you want to draw a line, um, and imagine you have, a, you have a rope. And when you have a very long rope, and you start to change your direction, it will react very slowly to it, because the rope is quite long. And if you have a very small rope, of course, it will follow all of your, your movements um, much quicker. So it's may, uh, more or less the same as a brush. Um, when you have a long bristled brush, you will have more control over a line, so to, uh, no, less control actually over a line, but you will have a smoother line overall. And with a shorter brush, you can make finer and like more controlled strokes, but it will also, like the possibility is also big that you will have less smooth uh, lines, so to say. All right. so. I usually have a, a size 2 regular series, uh, like this one here, that I'm using. And besides that, um, I have an additional, um, uh, actually this is a size 2 uh, miniature uh, series, is it? Yeah. So Winston Newton has also like this um, uh, speciality, so to say, that I can see it here, that this is both a size 2 brush and one, like the one on the right side, is um, like a miniature series brush. So it has shorter bristles. I think they did it because uh, many painters like to have the control and to, to be able to, to draw a little bit more precisely than the, the two brush. But um, I even using it usually for, uh, for different applications. So um, having both of these are, is very, very useful. Mm, they're quite expensive, as you might know. Uh, Winston Newton brushes are quite expensive, but uh, I think they're well worth the, the, the price if you know how to treat them right. They will last for quite some time. Also, my brush box, I always have a little brush soap, like this one here. And that is very, very useful. Um, once I'm done with, with, with painting, I clean all my brushes thoroughly, and then um, I don't have to worry about it and buy brushes too often. Um, then I have a special brush that I use for special applications. Is this one here. 
It's a brush that I call the Gypsy Brush. Uh, Gypsy Brush because it has been um, like an old Winston Newton brush that has served its purpose, where the split has uh, has uh, the tip has actually splitted, so it's not uh, it cannot be saved. And as you can see, it's just like a brush that this one is already a little bit worn down because usually I cut it around two two millimeters from the ferrule here, and I have a brush that. Uh, I can use to uh, quickly erase mistakes when I make a mistake. I have, I have it nearby and then I can just like go into for example a model like this and just like scrub off um, part of the part of the mistake very quickly and allow it to dry and really great. But not only it's not like an not only like an undo button for a, a painting, it's also um, great to uh, to, for example, distribute um, metallic pigment on um, on surfaces. So if I have a metallic, uh, for, let's say, for example, there is an axe here, and I want to uh, distribute metallic pigment just on a certain area, I can use this and kind of micro dry brush just on a very specified uh, surface, and it will also allow for very, very interesting um, textures that are on this uh, surface there. So I really recommend building yourself a gypsy brush at some point. <laughs> then for dry brushing, I also have um, these uh, bigger brushes. So you have a big dry brush here on the left side, smaller dry brush here um, for, well, more precise dry brushing. These are also very essential. And then there is also a brush that is a little bit like a, uh, like a dead, like the dead man's brush, this one. I exclusively use it to uh, take paint from paint pots onto the palette. And I don't have to worry. I don't do that with my Winston Newton brush. Because as soon as color reaches the ferrule, uh, the possibility that the tip splits is much higher. So for this, I have a special uh, Games Workshop brush <laughs> that has actually seen some, some stuff already. So. Um, you, you need something like that too. And then um, some people don't paint at all with, uh, with a little uh, paper towel next to their painting, uh, next to their water. I really like that and I really use it a lot, so I will have to have something like that. Okay, and uh, yes, you might wonder what, uh, what the deal is with this little cube here. Um, usually when you paint a model, you glue it onto something like a cube and then you start painting right away. But in this case, the cube itself is also an important uh, training device. Um, it has five <laughs> primed sides. So I will ask you to um, use these sides and practice the, uh, the different applications of the loaded brush onto this uh, cube first. And then we will go on and continue to paint the, the, the miniature afterwards. So this cube here now is, yeah, something like your test dummy. There is nothing you can make wrong. Uh, you can do wrong. It's very important with the loaded brush to really look at what you do. You know, to see how you try to apply it. Um, that way, I will see there are many, many things that 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 you can um, well do. I would not say wrong, but less uh, productively <laughs> with uh, applying the loaded brush. Um, so when I see it uh, in person, I can try to give you a suggestion about that. All right, so um, I will prepare some colors here onto the on, the on the wet palette, and then we will just give it a go with the, um, with the, with the cube. Here also we have the new Chimera colors, so if you guys are interested, um, like these are still the prototypes because, uh, yeah, I have, I've, I've, <laughs> I've left them at home, let's say it like this. And, um, but it's, it's the same thing. Um, there are also some little uh, swatches that you can see here. This is actually a Mojo Dilution Helper, uh, Consistency Helper. It's a little tool that uh, Ben and me have invented um, to communicate uh, consistency of paint. So a lot of people have a problem finding the right consistency of their paint. And these little things, they, they usually come in like a little, yeah, little over the box like this. Um, they are um, red ones and blue ones because some people have uh, difficulties and like kind of seeing uh, differences in red and blue color. It's, it's the only reason you don't need to apply this very color here on them. Uh, you can take any color. But the idea is that um, when, we, when we paint, we describe um, certain consistencies that are needed to achieve the, the, uh, the technique that we are telling you about. 
And for example, for the loaded brush, it is important to load the, in, for, the, for the general applications, to load the back of the, like the whole brush with medium layer consistency paint. So I have the paint here on my, on my palette. I dilute the, the paint, some water on here. And then I can, maybe like this, and then I can, I, I know I know, need a medium layer consistency, so this is how it should look. Mm. And then I, I put it on here, like rub it in a little bit, and then I, I make sure that I end up somewhere here. So I don't, like I can see how the medium tone of this paint looks in the brush. So this, for example, would be um, too highly diluted. So this would be something more like a, like a maybe medium glaze. <laughs> I compare these little swatches here with the ones that are above. So I know that I need a little bit more thicker color. Do the same on the next dot. With more color. And yeah, still a little bit on the light side, but with this I can slowly find the right consistency and I will know that this is like the right consistency for this technique. It's a medium layer consistency and I'm good to go uh, to apply it on the miniature. Quite useful. All right, so, um, okay. One more thing that we will need is, um, is a heavy body uh, white paint. In this case, it's uh, the Prima Acryl, Acryl Artist Acrylic uh, Titanium White. Um, we have not, like we have tried it out with, uh, with different heavy body whites, but not found a, a color that comes similar. So this one is actually ideal for the technique. And um, yeah, so I load the, load the brush with this uh, medium layer tone. And then I take a little um, dab of it on the tip of the brush, like this. Then um, I sometimes, it is something that comes with, with experience, how much white you need. If you don't need so much and you've taken too much, you can just like um, rub it on your thumb and just like lose a little bit of it. And then for example here, um, I start applying it like this in these motions. I anchor it first and then I, go, I start going down. And the more I go down, the, the, like the more the color will be released on the surface and uh, the white will remain here and the color, so to say, the darker color will remain here. So that's the general uh, theory behind the loaded brush. Now, there are a lot of uh, challenges that you will find uh, while trying to, to apply the loaded brush, for example, if you go um, down with two big motions, you will see these irregularities here because um, it's like just the brush stroke that you're using. That's a little bit like a zigzag. So this is something that is, that is difficult. And the other thing is that your white, your titanium white sometimes dries up and then it's like too thick to be applied onto the surface. So um, it is really something that you have, there are many, many factors that you have to develop a good feeling about. Um, and. Um, you will, with experience, you will find um, the answers to if that is, you know, already good or not. It's something that you, can, you have to just practice. It's not something that you will know right away. It's also that some people, what they do is, like I tried to tell you uh, about some of the mistakes that, <laughs> that a lot of people do. Um, sometimes people, they go down, they see that the, the transition here is not ideal, they, go, they start going up again, and then they lose like kind of everything and then they, they just try to finish it and they finish up with a big mess. So applying the loaded brush is also something that you should do quite in a quite relaxed mood. It's not a race, there's nothing you can do wrong. Um, take your time, you know, take a deep breath. Um, it's a little bit like you, know, you have to get into the Zen, you know, I saw people that were sitting there like extremely tense, like trying to apply it. And they were also getting quite angry because it didn't work out so well as they liked it to. Um, don't worry about this. Um, you can do nothing wrong, you know. This is like, first it's a cube, then it's a miniature. It will not be your last miniature for sure. So just give it a go. And um, a little bit, oh yes, I'm sorry, <laughs> because of the, like, the theory you've seen, it's, it's, it, it could be said it's quite easy, but then the, the practical application, there are some things that you should keep in mind. Um, so for the regular loaded brush, as I said, medium layer consistency into the brush and uh, don't go all the way, but leave a little bit of water in the back like that. 
Then uh, apply the pure titanium white on the tip. You have still the medium layer consistency here. And then when you go down on the surface, it's a little bit like mobbing a floor. Imagine you have a, you have a mop and the task is to apply a, an even uh, layer of water on the whole surface. So it shows it a little bit like here. Um, this is also the thing that, the, and this is, this is where it gets a little bit complicated. Um, you, you, try, you, on, you don't apply it also with the very tip at the start, but you apply it a little bit like sideways, like with a mop, you know. Imagine you had a mop and you put it down because you want to have the surface as even as possible. And then you start to, um, to anchor it also a little bit down, like to, to attach the white where you want to have it. And then when you feel that it's kind of flowing, you start to just like go down with the side. And the more you go out, so to say, into the like back of the surface, you kind of start to tilt the angle of your brush so you kind of go out. So like it's, it's a curve like this that you, you start very, very flat and then you, the further you go out, you kind of draw it out and yeah, <laughs> end up not flat anymore, if that makes sense. So I would ask you to um, just try, give it a try, you know, mix uh, any color of your choice. It is really doesn't matter. It can be any color, uh, but it should also not be an ink, obviously. It should be just a regular tone. If you don't have a color, I have a lot of them uh, in front here. So a blue is good, a red, whatever you want to have. And then I will go around and give you a little bit dab with the titanium white on your palette because you really need that one. And then you just give it a try. On the on the on the cube first. Oh, with the <laughs> synthetic brush, that's you killing me. It's like, yeah, look how the ma uh, how the master just like messes it up <laughs> with the synthetic. Powerful not to play, not to play with synthetics. <laughs> synthetics are just difficult, you know. Really, uh, it's not easy to to get a good finish yeah. with it. Yeah, this thing is a lot of fun. So like, put it down and then. Also quite like long. Mm -hmm. And then I start to go down as soon as I see that there is enough white here and then, you know, you have this blending. Mm -hmm. So it's really not a race. Most people, they are really, um, they are very nervous and they start to, you know, rub something mm -hmm. in here. Then there's like going down then they have zigzag. No, actually, again, oh yeah, sorry, this was the wrong one and then here. And then <laughs> take all of time, all of the time that you need, and then you see, okay, it's anchors, it doesn't do the <coughs> zip anymore, and then I go down. It's too early now, but I think the glass of beer would <laughs> <laughs> smooth <laughs> and <laughs> slow. It's more or less always the, <laughs> the same, but I kind of like when people, uh, when I, you know, when I can really see what people are doing and the mistakes or like the, the, the things yeah. that they do is, is, is they're according to their types, you know, of the character. You can really see that that some people are, eh, you know, they're like a little bit too timid. Some of them are too generous with the with the color. <laughs> no, let's hope we don't mess it up, right? I think the color. No, I think we are messing it up. <laughs> hey, that was not good. Okay, I'm running out of out of surfaces. I will try it here. Let's see. First the anchoring, so to say, and then when the color is floating, you can slowly start to go down. And then there's also one thing, if you, if you have too much, because a big color like that holds a lot of, uh, a big brush like that holds mm -hmm. a lot of color, you can clean your brush with water and then feather it out uh -huh. until the rest, so you ran out quicker, so to say. Yeah, a little bit like that. Um, okay, so now, if we now want to paint, uh, for example, this um, this demon here, uh, yeah. Um, the first step, like as you can see, the model is not just black as yours. Uh, it is also additionally primed with the white from the top, which uh, we call a two uh, K um, uh, priming. <laughs> so. There is, if you look at the model from the lower side, 
you will see a lot of black uh, portions. Mm, it's hard to, to set the focus. But here was the, like it was sprayed black first, and then from the top you will see it's mostly white. Um, it can also have a little angle, but this is basically the main light source <coughs> on most of the models. Um, you have <coughs> something like that. <coughs> Sorry, you need to drink something. <laughs> Paint water, it's always the best. Mm, perfect. Okay, so. Um, the way this model is primed will help us with, um, with uh, many techniques. It will just save us time. <laughs> so, um, actually I would, uh, I would say we will go with some crazy mix of something like a, like a turquoise blue uh, in the lower parts. And a nice uh, magenta tone in the upper parts. Uh, I think I... Um, can I have the red uh, chimera? Oh, there it is. Oh, I'm so sorry. The, yeah, no, sorry. Thanks. <laughs> and a little bit of that nice... Actually, this tone here is pretty nice. Maybe a little bit more purple. Okay. <clears throat> so the first step that oh, that I would like to do is um, apply uh, something like a wet blending here. <coughs> so, <coughs> damn, <coughs> I never, <coughs> I never have a, as we say in German, a frog in like. <laughs> sitting in my throat, but today is the day. <laughs> All right, um, so wet blending is uh, also like a great technique because on a surface like that, it will um, give us a very, very quick, a nice result on the first go. Um, the dilution is a little bit like a heavy layer consistency, not too thin. And we will apply it here on the, for example, on the legs, like the lower side here. So yeah, I apply the color also quite generously down here. Then I will take another color that I want to blend this with and put it on a, like a, an upper side, like here. And this is highly diluted? This is pretty diluted, yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, again, let's say maybe medium light layer consistency. And then we allow the color to, to just blend onto the surface. Uh, and we also allow the color to just stay in their respective areas. So the, 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 uh, the purple tone is here, the blue one is here. And then in between, we take a, um, a clean brush and we allow this color to just like float together in this, in this middle, middle area here. That's, okay, it's quite hard to see, I guess. And actually there is more color in the model. Yes as is on the, uh, on the camera. Yeah, the red is really, it's very, very, a lot of pigments, so it's, it's really a joy for the eyes. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but with wet blending, the first thing you do is you try to, uh, to reach this, a little bit like sketch these, these, these color transitions um, and just see how Actually, it's really hard to see, but um, you try to, to, to apply something like a, like a base tone on it, and you need this like to dry, and after that, like this is a perfect 
base to apply uh, loaded brushes on top because you already have some transition, like some, some transitions there. And then you need to uh, still keep the medium color, the medium tone that you have, and just apply the load brush accordingly um, to the shapes that you have. For example, if you look at the demon like this, um, again, he consists of, of, of geometric primitives, and knowing these geometric primitives will really help you to know how to apply the light on, to, on top, if you know what materiality this is. Um, so in this case, it's a little bit like de demonic skin, so you might think it's similar to, to regular, like flesh. And then um, you would have to determine if the skin is, for example, shiny, or if it's more like, uh, like human skin, for example, but just like with a lot of colors. And then uh, applying the light accordingly to that. You know, like for example, the, the tail here is basically like a, like a cylinder, like elongated cylinder. So there would be very likely a light a little light following this, this shape here, and there would be a bigger light tone here. One more thing, we will need to wait until like a lot of this is, uh, is dried up uh, in order to apply a loaded brush. But when I will apply the loaded brush, I also try to do it from the very top or like from the, from the center of focus. So if I want to put the center of focus on the face and on the upper part of the head, this is where I will apply the first loaded brush. And then I will work my way down, uh, down the model. Um, it is because I can do it very quickly. If I, if I take color in my brush, uh, apply some titanium white to the tip and apply the loaded brush, it will be quite pure. And then after that, I don't clean the brush, but I already have the, uh, like it's, 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 it's a little bit brighter than the base tone, but this is something that I can still use because it's, it's a little bit bright, uh, uh, darker already, that I can use on parts that are lower on the body. For example, the leg here. I think I will explain it, I will show it to you <laughs> while I'm on it, because I think the explanation is a little bit, um, it's a little bit too, too complicated like that. I will show you in a second what I mean. But this face, some, uh, some people also call sketching. You know, they, they, they are really, using uh, wet blending and um, very rough techniques to just set the light accordingly and say, okay, this here will be pink, this here will be darker, uh, like a deeper red. And when they don't like something, they can change it around quickly because they, have, they are not actively painting like layers on it, but they are just trying to set the whole um, color scheme for this, for this model. So you can do the same for the pox workers. I would recommend you to use um, obviously like a skin tone, something like that is quite good, cardiac flash. And then also have some, something like a, you can have a blue or a green that kind of shows the taint, you know, of the demonic taint that you then start to elaborate. Or you can also have something like an orange that is, um, that might be the color for the, for the sickness that they have and then expand into something reddish. So you're really free with using whatever you want to, want to use, actually. <coughs> oh, yes. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's funny because this first step is always very messy and you play around with color and think like, wow, this looks cool. But um, you will have to tidy everything up afterwards, so... There is no easy way around it. Like first you will play around and say like, hey, I want these colors here and these colors here. And afterwards comes the part where you need to tidy everything up and clean everything up, which is sometimes really a long process.
Mm -hmm. It's actually a lot of fun to just sketch in some colors, color transitions. These demons are also quite perfect for that because they are very colorful and I really like to just set the color like that. It's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. And a good thing about wet blending is also that it gives you some surprising um, tones. It doesn't matter that it's so messy at this point because we will go and clean everything up. And it's also good to have a hair dryer nearby, so because. <laughs> Yeah, this takes some time, really. <coughs> mm. The old scaly green. Always fun. Yeah, it was one of the nicest colors. <laughs> it's hard to get an alternative. Yeah. Yeah, it went out of production. <laughs> uh, I think it's just relaxing, peaceful travel music, <laughs> they call it. I don't, I don't know if it's something in particular. It sounds a little bit like Neverwinter. Okay, I think that some parts are, some parts are, we will just give it a go. So here I have the, I try to mix the medium tone um, of this red. Um, to have it as the color that I have in the reservoir. And then also the brush is a little bit smaller, then I change to a smaller brush, ob obviously. Then take some titanium white on the tip. And then for example here, on this weird tail, I start to apply a loaded brush and go down the, the tail. Maybe you can see that it, uh, it's hard to see, but it clears, down, it clears out this um, very rough surface and also gives a blending in this, uh, in this area as we need it. For smaller muscles, like for example here, this is a little bit like a, like a sphere, right? I mean, more or less, it's like a heart, heart shape or something like that. So, for a surface like this, we need to dose the amount of, um, of white that we take quite carefully. So it's actually just a very small amount, like this maybe. And then we also, because this is not a surface, like a flat surface anymore, but this is a sphere, so we try to make this move according to the surface, like a little, little crescent or like a little C shape and go down like this. It's also important not to forget about um, these connecting muscles because when you, when you paint um, um, like muscle groups like that, you will end up with something that looks a little bit like, um, like, a, a, scat, like a shattered, maybe gemstone or something because all of these these muscles here, of course, we need to blend them individually, but also they are part of this whole group here. So um, it is important to not only blend the one muscle, but then when you start blending, um, to apply some of the shadow, uh, of the medium tone also all over, like also these crevices here, like down here, here and here. I'm not sure if you can see that. I mean, I can also pass the model around in a second. 
but we are basically using the loaded brush to smoothen out the very rough, um, the very rough uh, wet blending that we have done before. Yeah, it looks, I think I will pass it around. It looks so much, so much worse on the screen. Yeah. If you paint yellow, if you paint green, you can use white for the Yeah, you can. Yellow. Yeah, you can. You can use yellow exactly. Like this, it doesn't. It's only that it blends like two colors on in the brush onto the surface. So, whatever you want to blend, you can use it mm, naturally. Yeah. In theory, you can also uh, load like apply a loaded brush with a, with a um, shadow color. Could also do that. No, it's it's just about the the very uh, process of the color floating down. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't follow like that set rules. You know, it can be whatever you want to, and you, you can just experiment with it and just try it out. But mostly we use it for highlights. Yes.
Okay, I think I will pass it around and have a look what you have been doing <laughs> so far.
maybe it's yeah, it's, it's really hard to see, but after working <coughs> around with this, you can really clear up uh, some of the muscles and start to add some lights, um, clear up the roughness of it, um, just using loaded brushes over and over. <laughs> so it's a little bit hard sometimes to find the right uh, medium tone that you have, for example, in an area like this here. But it's not rocket science, so don't worry. It's you can just take anything and also when you have applied the loaded brushes like that it's also great to um, to glaze uh, to use a glaze and glaze the, the different layers down a bit again so for this you can use specialized tones uh, there is also one that is out of production is the bar red uh, it's like a like a uh, like a wash so this we can also apply in a very very thin uh, consistency glazing consistency and then and then you apply it down here on the lower part clean the brush and then pull it just upwards so that way um, you will you will get some more tones and some more saturation in your um, in your loaded in, in your in your surfaces and you get also a little bit of a shine and I'm I'm a big fan of that I really like that Okay, we'll walk around and just see if someone has a question <laughs> and um, yeah, show you the model in hand. That's always a good thing. <laughs> First, try to solve the the, um, the surface globally, so to say, and then become more and more small while you go. So build up the, the general light situation mm. first, and then. I really like the sketching step because it's a little bit like setting the the whole light, and uh, you begin to see the miniature, and then you know on which groups you need to work and how much more light they need. And also, <laughs> not so you don't need to um, always reload the loaded brush, you can also uh, work downwards because now we are getting darker and darker mm -hmm. as more um, uh, distance, so to say, we go with the with the surfaces, and it will get darker and darker, and we can go down uh, with the color. So here, for example, it's already darker than here. You can also mix a little bit more of the shadow color, and then also work down here. So and after this step, um, it's just like about tidying down, like like setting. For example, then we see okay, maybe we want to have the the main ri ri light reflex here and here. So now we will go um, more fine with less um, less white, and then try to also add a little bit more light here on these forehead, how the light would naturally occur here and allow this to dry. Also all of these little things, sometimes it's just enough to take some white and just start to, um, to put a little highlight on them because that will just um, bring them out of this darkness there. And very important that um, we always need to go back and forth um, also with glazes. So sometimes, like this is now, it, it tends to be quite flat, even if you put the light on. And then it's important to take a, like, a, like a shadow tone and just glaze it from down here upwards like that. Yeah, and then I would also recommend uh, breaking this very blue area down with some uh, reds, for example, some reds because it's um, 
Otherwise, it's 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 just blue and purple. Mm -hmm. So I think I will um, uh, armor brown, something like that, or uh, or really like a red tone. Mm -hmm. we'll get it, and then we will hide them here in the shadows. Mm -hmm. Thank you.